What's up, everyone? Thank you for joining uh, on this episode with Peter Ziev. If it's your first time, great to have you here. If not, great to have you back. Peter, his journey truly starts, especially for what he's doing today, uh, in 1976. That's when he graduated from MIT and later went to grad school. Peter is someone who's in the engineering space and the business space, but it was in college that he developed a company called EFB Inc. That was the first of the likes which he really started to branch off onto his own with some of his friends. But uh, later on, got his PhD in mechanical engineering, which developed his skill and business acumen even more. That's when he developed a low voltage electromagnetic riveter. This invention is like a a pillar to Electro Impact, which is the company Peter has to this day that he's been running for multiple decades. But without this invention and without the story behind it that he goes into to get to finding the idea the, the seedling to come up with that invention, he wouldn't be where he is today. And as he says, it's either luck or God that makes things uh, what they are and things can become fruitful from that. So Peter goes through the whole journey of the inventions, his life, and so much more. So thank you for joining and let's dive in to Peter's life. Dream. That's one small step for man. I am the greatest. You want something? Go get it. Period. Peter, I appreciate you taking the time to talk, and there's a lot of things to dive into. So I'm just going to let you take the floor here as you had something you wanted to start off and sharing. Uh, if you want to show the folks, for those watching on video, the, uh, the picture that he's going to show is of the Electro Impact. I believe it's the offices, right? The first offices, or what is this? Yeah, that was the first office we had. I'm going to go back behind that. I think I'm going to go further back behind that because that's way late. That's pretty late in the game. It wasn't even my first company. My wow. First- so have you always been entrepreneurial in, in all that you've done, or when did you have that knack to start creating stuff? It started at MIT. Mm-hmm. At MIT, um, just a, uh, uh, let me see. I want to go to uh, origins or organize. Yeah, so here I'll tell you a little bit about Melcher. I mean, this was this was my professor at the University of uh, MIT. That's not even a university. I don't even know what they call it. Um, I ran into this guy by accident. Everything is an accident. It, either there's an accident or that God has a plan. I can't tell you which one it is. Um, It's definitely, no, okay, you're recording. I hope you're recording here. Okay, I don't want to interrupt with that, but I want to share. So this is a picture, this is a picture of your professor and you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here we are. See that? Yeah. Yeah, there's Melcher. Um, If, um, this, And you can see here in the upper left-hand corner, can you mm. see me in the, in, on the left? Oh, the tall one. <laughs> yeah, with the check pants. Yeah. Next to Melcher. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Melcher is like, he was one of the most preeminent professors at MIT. And I ran into him by accident. And somehow, you can see we became pretty close friends. Um, wow. here's, um, look at down to the lower left. <laughs> Faro. Yeah. 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 For those watching on video, as uh, I'm going through, uh, with this professor here, if you're watching, if you're listening only on audio, I definitely advise you to check out the video because, uh, there's some cool graphics here, a, a different type of, uh, recording type session that we're doing here, but I actually like it even more so because we're getting like a presentation of your life. It's like a timeline. So yeah. I ran into Melcher by accident. Um, I got to MIT by accident. I didn't apply there. Um, I, um, I went there uh, be, to visit a friend, um, Bob Blau. I went to visit him in, um, in 1973. I went to visit him. He was living in a fraternity at MIT. And um, I was at the University of Pennsylvania my freshman year. 
And I got to, um, but I wasn't um, there. By, that's one of my best friends there, Rick Ehrlich. Oh, so you went to University of Penn first. Yeah, just for a year. Wow. And then I um, went to visit Bob. And I never even went on campus. I just, I, th- I, I asked the question, why aren't I here? How come I'm not here? This is my place. And um, so I went, um, instead of going, taking the train back to, I like Mark Zahn, I knew him very well. He was um, a, a sidekick of mine. He wrote that he did this uh, memorial for Melcher. Melcher died young, um, maybe suspicious circumstances. Um, genius, absolute genius. Um, you know, of the kind that comes along just ever so rarely. And, um, but I visited Bob Lau and um, I said to myself, how come I'm not here? Of course, I wasn't there because no one suggested it. And, um, but that, you know, and the difference between my dad and Bob's dad was Bob's dad, uh, Fred was his name. He looked at Bob in the eye and he said, you're going to MIT and you're studying engineering. Now get it done. And that was it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. My dad didn't say anything like that. Um, I can tell you that when my son, my oldest son, was ready to go to college, you know what I did? You said you're going to I MIT? In the eye, <laughs> I, pointed in, I, pointed, I pointed a finger at him and I said, Michael, you're going to MIT and you're studying engineering. Now get it done. Because <laughs> I, I suffered very badly for mm. losing my first year. I was a full year behind. It was just painful as hell. I just, uh, it was torture of a different type. And I don't really recommend it to anyone. Yeah. So, so what was like the, the click for you when, you know, you're at UPenn and you visited MIT? Was it just like. Just fraternity. That's it. I never went on campus. <laughs> and I, and I said, well, how come I'm not here? Because all the, the kids in the fraternity were like me. Mm. They were my type of people. They were doing different, um, you know, things with technology and they're trying to figure out how to, you know, uh, run the meter backwards on the, uh, on the frater- frat house. They wouldn't have to pay for electricity. And they were, um, and they were doing all kinds of things that uh, would be the kind of things that I would be interested in. And I thought, God, how come I'm not here? So instead of taking the train back to, Philadelphia, which was my plan to go back Sunday night to attend class. I told Bob I'm going to stay another. I think I, I can't remember exactly. I think I was sleep, had a sleeping bag and I was sleeping on, in the floor of his um, frat room. Mm-hmm. And I um, and I went. I said I'm going to stay another day. And on Monday morning, I finally went on campus, and I went to the uh, admissions office and I said I want to go here. And they said, Well, sure. Here, here's the form. Show them out. And if we accept you, you can come in the fall. Well, they did accept me, and I went there in the fall. And um, I got there. It was very, very difficult. I was a full year behind um, in, in a very hard school, so I was really suffering. But um, one thing that happened that was very uh, favorable is I was, um, I remember being very, t- I was exhausted all the time because I was trying to work 24 hours a day to try to catch up. And I was in a, uh, in a room for students, the IEEE room, you know, which is the Society of Electrical Engineers, and I was drinking a Coke. And I saw a brochure, a little thin brochure that was on the floor with people's footprints on it. People were walking over it. I picked it up and I opened the brochure and it was about undergraduate research opportunities. And, MIT is famous for this Europe program, uh, undergraduate research opportunities. At this point, I'm a sophomore. And I saw a little article um, from Professor Melcher about um, his work with electrostatics and air pollution control. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I I, I like that stuff. I like electrical engineering. I used to like to hook little things up with jumper cables and make light bulbs go on and off and switches. I always looked like that kind of stuff. Was that, was that at a young age when you would do those? 
Yes, I remember. There's, I have a diary from maybe from fifth grade where it talks about me, mom giving me a nine volt battery and I was, you know, hooking things up to it and, you know, nothing very sophisticated, just making wow. lights go on and off. And um, I like that. And my mother was doing work on air pollution. She was an environmentalist and she was, I helped her work on her, um, I helped her do her master's thesis where I, she had to make these environmental chambers and she was trying to see the, detect the effect of the smoke on plants with and without filtering. So I was doing all this work and you know, I spent months working on that. So I, you know, I thought, oh, that's interesting. I never really put the two together. So I saw Melcher's uh, phone, phone number there and there was a phone, an old fashioned uh, phone. You know, I picked it up and I dialed the four, num four digit number that would go to his office. I assumed then I'd speak to the secretary. Instead, I heard a voice on the other end of the line and said, Jim, you know, Jim. It's like, oh my God, this is him. Here I'm a sophomore, I was, you know, 18 years old and this mm. professor, full professor, uh, is shouting at the other line, what do you want? You know, she didn't say that, she said, Jim. I said, oh, well, I'm just new here. And I saw this, you know, we're sure. And uh, I thought it was interesting. And he said, come here now. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm like, well, oh, so I'm sorry, but I don't even know where you are. And I don't know, really know where you are. I said, he told me, go read the number off the door. So I went to the door, I read the number. He told me to go across the sky bridge up the elevators, one block down the hallway. He's the first door on the left. I go in there. He's, he's sitting at a big desk. I sit down and we, we talk for a while, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes. He decides that something went off in his mind and he said, start work now. I'm like, like, like what type of work did he ask? I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> start now so he said go across the hall and that's where our lab is and paul warren will set you up with some, some work to do start now so i went across the hall and there was paul warren paul warren's also dead they died at the same time paul and martin and, um, professor melcher and he got me set up in the lab and he gave me a workbench and some tools and i started working and um, it was just the most incredible thing. And now all of a sudden it, it occurred to me why I was at MIT. Why did, was I on this mission? And here I can see it, aha, this is God's plan. I'm gonna, you know, this is where I'm gonna go. Mm. So I put my full energy into that. And, um, and I worked, I met two other uh, students there who um, I started a company with. As soon as I graduated, got my undergraduate degree, they were getting their PhDs in electrical engineering. And I, and I'm working with this, I convinced them that we're gonna start a company. The three of us would start a company and probably the three most different people you can imagine, but we liked each other. So um, that's, uh, and it was in the area that Melcher had pioneered of using electrostatics in a different way to um, control air pollution. I can show you a picture of my two, my two partners. Mm. And this is in the company you created when you came out of MIT with your two partners who were PhDs at the time, was that Electro Impact or was that something else? No, it was called EFB Incorporated. Okay. Yeah. And what, what did you focus on with it? It was, um, it was about um, making air pollution control machines. Wow, that's a vitally important thing in today's climate. It was, a, it was fun. It was fun. Here's <laughs> uh, here is uh, the two guys that um, that I I was with. Okay, so you can see Zahidi was the president. He's an Iranian guy on top mm. of the U-Haul. And Jeff was, um, is a, he's a Swedish guy with <laughs> the blonde hair. Um, they're both very dear to me. 
and um, the three of us started EFB Incorporated. It's still, you can still look it up on the internet. It's a successful company. But that's the beginning of my brother's uh, blue Camaro in the front there. That's pretty, was, that's pretty insane that uh, U-Haul, I didn't know U-Haul looked like that. Was that a trailer? Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. It's a trailer behind the blue Camaro mm. um, that I was driving. That was my brother's car. My brother and I were roommates at MIT. I got to MIT the same time he did. So mm. we, were, we, we shared an apartment. I just, you know, we shared a car. And uh, there it is. And the U-Haul, and there's the, uh, you can see the filter in the back. So we started that company. I was still at MIT. I was working on, on some other degrees. I had my undergraduate degree, but I was working on a master's degree in um, electrical engineering and a master's degree in environmental engineering. I got two more degrees from MIT while I was running this company. Wow. Um, how did, and can I ask, uh, to just interject real quick, how did you manage running EFB, like a full-time company with your partners and getting another uh a master's on top of that and other degrees when you first start a company you know you, it's not you're not as busy as it after you get the company going so we did what we we, we did what we could do and then as you know by the time i started to get done with my work at mit the business started to increase and i was i jumped in with you know with all four feet and I started to uh, work on the uh, EFB product. I did a lot of traveling to Vancouver, BC. Zahidi was mostly loved to do sales, still does. And um, mm. he was, um, he somehow got interested in work in selling, in one second. So he was um, selling in Vancouver, BC, a long way from Boston. So, and I liked the, I liked the, the I, I was a, uh, I like to be dirty and jump on big machines and turn wrenches. And so I would travel out to Vancouver, BC, and I was installing machines. I installed three machines in Vancouver, BC. Um, and that got me interested in living in the Northwest. Never been to the Northwest before. But I used to go up there and and, uh, and work at, on the machines. And um, I started to look around and think, hey, wow, this would be an amazing place to live. So that was in my mind. Um, those guys didn't share that belief. They liked living in the Boston area. They thought that was the greatest place. Zahidi still lives in the same house that he bought when he was, when I was still at uh, EFP. He bought a house uh, in Newton. And he still lives in the same house. He loves that house. And Jeff um, and him got into a fight. And Jeff moved over to Europe for a while to try to do some stuff. And then he came back. Now he's up in Canada. So. Um, and and as for EFB, what did you guys? What products did you create? Because you said you worked on the machines. What was it? It was um, e EFB filter. Um, I can just show you here. I'm going to get a screen go to the internet. So it was filters, okay. And big industrial filters, big industrial filters. Got it. Um, yeah, you can see them right And those were, the air, those were the air pollution products that would capture any air pollution? Yes, they capture air pollution, exactly. They capture Wow. Air. So that's the product that we developed. That was Melcher's idea. Melcher had an interesting way to um, think about how to design these machines. Um, so you can see they're kind of big machines. Oh, they're absolutely massive. Wow. You see, you see here, EFB Inc. since its inception, 1977. You know who started in 1977? Me. I started it. Um, I started it and Zahidi was very reluctant. He was planning to go back to Iran and sell electronic watches and um, transistor junk. That was his, and I said, no. No, you're not going to do that. We're going to start a company. It's like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I said, yeah, you're, you're, we're going to start a company um, and I'll file the papers and, um, and we'll invest some little bit of money. It was very little money we put in. Um, mostly it was Zahidi put in maybe 
I, I remember he put in 50,000, I put in 25,000, Jeff put in 25,000. And so we had 100,000, we started a company. Um, but we, yeah, we made, we didn't, we had fun. It was, uh, it was pretty good. Um, wow. And we did that, it was EFB Inc. Um, and then I did that until 1983 when I decided that um, I wanted to, you know, it was, I was still very young and, you know, that's a good time to make your move. I didn't want to be in that business anymore because um, people didn't really care if the stuff worked or not. It was just more like they, they had, just had to tick a box. So I'm, I'm ha- proud of the advancements I made in the field. Um, but um, I, it was time to go. And then I just said, I'm going to go and I'm going to go to the Northwest and I'm going to go to the University of Washington and get my PhD in mechanical engineering. Because so I want to have degrees in mechanical and electrical engineering. Okay, so we left on the best of terms. Um, and, um, and I drove out to uh, Seattle mm-hmm. to attend the University of Washington. And relocated for, which is probably now, uh, since you moved there, you've been there all your life up until that point or no? No, I'm from Wisconsin. Oh, but like, as you moved there to go to the University of Washington, have you stayed there since? Yeah. I since got, 83, okay. I haven't left. Wow. I got 83 is when I left EFB. You see, it started in, I started in 77. I feel I filed the papers. And then I, and I left in 83. I started grad school in September of 1983. And I got my PhD in June of 1986. Wow. And, then, and, and, and one question I would love to ask for, you know, younger folks and, and even some older folks as well is like, what would you advise people early on in their careers to do um, as you have many different options, you know, many different opportunities? Like, what would you say many of these individuals should focus on since you have a, a large uh, scope of uh, insight in your own life. Yeah, by the way, that machine there on the left, that was all my design there. I designed the whole thing and built it. Um, what is my... I don't know. Um, you know, because of what my dad told me, I knew I had to have either I'm going to do what my professor, my brother did. My older brother became a, a tenured professor and you can stay in that job as long as you want. And my dad, he came out of a graduate class of five mechanical engineers. And I remember one of the guys that my dad liked very much was rising up in a corporation. It was up when he got up to the top. Um, they had a down year and the board of directors said, well, I guess we don't need you anymore. And they told him and he's done. And my dad didn't like that. And he said, you know, you got to do something where you decide where you're going to retire. So my dad had like a, it was always in small businesses um, or not so small, but he was always in a position where he could control when he's going to retire. And that's kind of, you know, he, he did. And that's was something that, um, you know, I, I accept it. It made sense to me. Mm. Um, and is this so, the joy, this the joy matrix you were referring to off the record? Uh, yeah, with the making sure matrix, you have control. The joy matrix is, um, is something that is very powerful. Um, I've probably pro- sent, shown it six or eight times. And every time <laughs> I give it, it says something that I think is something that is, um, I wasn't planning to get into that, but I can. I have to go find that PowerPoint. But the thing, the thing. No, it's okay. You can just describe it. The the thing about the joy matrix that is uh, people don't think about is that if you, let's say there's a, uh, a company and they say, you know, you, you're like, you're the smartest and the best guy there is. I want you to run my company. Okay, it's a great honor, of course, but no matter what you do, that company might say, you're not, you're not sending us back enough profit. You're not making enough money for us. So you, you're working, you're, you're took us off, but they're telling you that you're not, 
you're not sending them enough mm, money yeah. back to corporate. And maybe, um, you know, and that's, and so it gets unpleasant. And the same thing is true in reverse. If you own a company and you say, you know, I'm too feeble, old, or just too lazy to run it. Like, well, there's a guy named Gates, like that, that like that. And, um, and so you get somebody else in to run it. Well, the same is true. You're sitting here, you're the owner, and you're thinking to myself, God, that guy is just not performing. He's just not giving me what, I, what, I, what I'm, I'm expecting, what I'm deserving as the owner. So there's just this conflict is just built into it. And the resolution of it is very simple, is to own it and run it, is to do both. That's the resolution of that problem, is to own and to run. So that is, um, those are the, the constituents. So when you hear people complain about, oh, it's, you know, the difficulties of um, entrepreneurship, usually I, I find most of the complaints are related to the fact that they are running a company for some or somebody else or they're owning a company they don't run. But most people that own a company and run a company are very happy. Who can they blame when things don't go well? They blame themselves. So it's it's something that is just built into the system. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I have I have a few individuals, both older in age, that have gone through corporate ladder and company just went bankrupt and they had nothing left. And then I had other individuals younger in age who are part of startups or companies that they're working their tail off, but there's not as much control or ownership. And that's where they feel like their sweat equity is not getting rewarded. Although pay is great. They want some type of higher ROI or, you know, through equity or ownership and uh, they want more control. And I think you're right though. It's, it's worth the burden of and the labor of entrepreneurship to do something on your own. Cause you're going to uh, you're going to own everything. And it's much better to do that than, have a lack of control when you're working so hard. Yeah, I, I like the I like that model better. Um, rather than I, the venture capital, what I tell you, I think you earlier you said, what would I uh, what would I tell young people? Mm. Well, I don't know really how I can tell them or new start people. Um, I don't know what, how I can tell them what they what type of business they might want to be in. I, I I don't have really any idea about that. Um, if someone comes to me, like uh, sometimes I'll have some lady talk to me. She says she wants to prepare food or, 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 or fix people's nails. I mean, that's not going to work. Not in the USA. That those are inevitably going to be a failure. But if you um, if you're in something that could potentially have some income that can support people, mm. the one thing I tell people, in my view, you're better off to not sell any controls, keep all the stock. Yes, it takes a lot longer. It takes longer. But at the end of the day, you'll be better off. So what if it takes longer? And then the, the, and what people tell me when I say that, oh, no, I don't want to. I'm in seven years. I'm out seven years. I want to spend seven years on this. Then I'm out seven years. You're nowhere when you start a new company. You're still floundering. You know, you're still drowning in the water. You, you know, looking for a life preserver. Yeah. You know, that's not enough time. 10 years is the minimum time it takes for a company to be, to have any credibility. 20 years is better than 10. 30 years is better than 20. But this whole idea, I'm going to start a company in seven years, I sell it. Well, good luck to you. But that's not the way I saw it. And here's the good, here's the good news for me. Here's the good news. Yeah, this is right after EFB. I know you're going to talk about the next part of the timeline where you made your own, right? The good news is this. The good news is We had a hell of a lot of fun there. 
It wasn't a big fancy place. But it was fun. We had we had a blast. In fact, I didn't. I, I seriously didn't think life could be any better. Um, we it was right next to University Village Shopping Center, which was uh, kind of a, a trendy shopping center. We'd go down there for lunch, and there was a. We used to have the Burt Gilman Running Trail right next to Electro Impact, which is a big deal in Seattle. Burt Gilman, right behind, right on the Burt Gilman Trail, and. Um, we were learning things very quickly, um, but it wasn't good enough for some people. Mm. I, we couldn't stay. Oh, so you had to upgrade in, in offices? Because right now, what, what, what are you showing right now? The Electron Pack original offices? Yep. Wow. And I, I was happy there. Actually, I was a professor at the University of Washington at the same time, which is right behind it. it was, and I lived right up the street. I mean, it was like perfect. I never, you know, I could walk from the University of Washington to the Electro Impact to my home. Wow. It was all to get close by and everything was uh, very easy to, you know, under control. And we weren't making a lot of money, but we were having fun. And then Boeing said, no. They said, no, you can't stay there. Boeing said you can't stay there. I said, no. Why so? Well, it has to do with this. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the picture of the group. You know, the first group I had. You see, you know, it looks nice, but we're all wearing shorts. We, we always wear shorts. Um, but all those people are still there, basically. Wow. How old were you guys in that picture? I was 31, I think. Wow. So here I am on the first uh, AutoCAD terminal. So this guy, he was talking to Boeing about how we can do this big project and that big project. And, and he, was, he was bending the ear of people and they're like, Okay, so we'll come visit you. So they come visit and then we're in a garage. I was like, no, mm. you're not gonna quote on this project if you're in a garage. And they got really mad because he was talking a big game. We had all the, we had the technology, but that they, that's not good enough for Boeing. They wanted to see the facilities that could get the job done. Um, and it wasn't going to happen in the garage. And so we had to move. Boeing said, you will move. <laughs> and so, oh my God, there goes the life of Riley. You know, forget about, you know, University of Washington, Electro Impact House, that's gone. Forget that, that's done. Mm. You've got, that, that's got to end. You just can't have that anymore. So there, there's me with James, James Ng. I, I have a Mac Plus there. Wow. So that's how it was. And uh, yeah, that's Lawrence there on the left. He just retired. Uh, last month, he just retired. That's, and there's Peter Janicki. He's, uh, uh, he's got now owns a company bigger than Electric Impact. Wow. Maybe you can, do, you can do an article on him. <laughs> um, so um, we, had to, we had to move. But when you said, you're going to move, you know, either, either, Basically, close your mouth. Um, so we had to move. And um, I lucked out. Um, I found this building. Oh, wow. And when you moved, you stayed in Washington? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That, that's like uh, 20 miles north of the old electron pack. So what did you guys do since you had very limited capital? Like, how did you manage getting a whole new facility? And like, did you get the Boeing contract eventually or no? We were getting Boeing contracts. 
Oh, wow. All the time. All the time. And what did I you mean, do specifically for them? All kinds of manufacturing stuff. Um, okay. we, were, we, were, we were making uh, riveting heads. We were making uh, coils. We were making man lifts. We were making tooling. All kinds of stuff. But it was very small scope. But we were the, he, John was talking, you know, on, you see him on the phone there. He was talking big stuff. And then they come and see us. They say, you can't do big stuff in here. So we started looking all around for a nice facility. And I ran into this building. This, uh, and I love this building. This building, um, I, re I remember um, I, I called a guy. I was, you know, I wanted to find pl a place that you can get to from both the eastern and western side of Lake Washington. And um, I, there was a guy who had a, a so I, I, was, I didn't want to be on the east side because I lived on the west side. And then there's a, a, these floating bridges and they're like parking lots. You literally cannot see a car move on these, on these bridges. It's just, there's just so many cars trying to get across. So they're floating parking lots and I did not want to have to go across that. So I wanted to find a place either north or south. And um, so I found, I, I was looking for a place and I found an old ad for a, a building in Muckleteo. I didn't, never heard of Muckleteo. I went up to visit the building and the owner came out and he said, I can't sell it to you um, because I have environmental problems. So after I talked to him, I drove around and I parked the car and I saw this building. I said, that is the most beautiful building I have ever seen. It was surrounded by trees all around. It had windows, it had skylights, it had conference rooms, it had manufacturing. It was like, oh my God, how come I can't find a building like that? Mm. So um, it was EMI back then. So I, I, as I, I left Muckleteo, I was driving toward Edmonds. We used to work with another company down there and I was heading to their shop. I had a desk there and um, I got down there I can't remember why I didn't. I think I had a cell phone by then. First, an old Motorola flip phone, but um, it would be, um, be 1993 is when we bought this building. And I called the real estate. I saw a real estate sign on the way down on a really crappy building. And when I got, I wrote down the number. I got down to uh, Novatech, which was our partners. We partnered with them on stuff. And I got a head of desk there. I went, went and sat at the desk and I called the number that I had written down from uh, on the way home. And the real estate agent answered and he asked what we did. I told him what we did. He said, well, that building you're looking at there, that's no good. That's not what you want. I said, yeah, I know it's not what I want, but I can't find anything else. He said, I know of another building. And he started to describe this building. And it was a building that I had admired. I said it was the most beautiful building. And I knew he was talking about the same building from the description. He just started giving me a description of this building that was for sale, but there was no sign on it because the owner didn't want to alert his customers that he was going to sell. And I was like, I cannot believe this is happening, that they're, they are offering to sell this building that I had admired. And I bought it within a week. I, just mm. bought, I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> had to jump on it. I bought it. I jumped on it. It's like, I'll take it. <laughs> Yeah. Now, so, so did Boeing end up visiting these new headquarters uh, or no? Oh yeah. <laughs> Boeing, yeah. Boeing was there a thousand times. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so we used to move, we, then we moved into this building and the place on Blakely street was rented and we just let that rent lapse. And uh, here we're here. And uh, this is where we, the business really grew. Um, this building really caused it to grow. We really just time. like like the building like the ability to work well inside the building was like the catalyst to start growing more yeah wow yeah now keep in mind the internet had not been invented yet there was no internet um there was very little technology um that was another story it was not long after we bought this building i was at a conference and um I was, uh, we used to go to these conferences for the SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers, but they also did aerospace. 
and we, we and we would give a little party and people would come to your room for the party. They don't allow that anymore, but it was very popular back then. And, you know, nothing really terrible happened, but they became banned. It used to be we'd have a party. And there were two engineers from Boeing that came to the party at our suite. We would pass out invitations. Like we take it, we write out, we print out a piece of paper with all the room number and the time, and you can come and get free beer and food and just hang out. It was fun. And of course, you can't do that anymore, but we did it back then. And the year would be um, right after we moved in, it would be um, uh, 1994 when this happened. And I was at this conference and there were two guys from Boeing and one said to the other, I just received an email from outside of Boeing. One Boeing guy talking to the other, I'm eavesdropping. I'm like, oh my God, there's something going on here <laughs> that I don't know about, <laughs> but I better find out. <laughs> this is when we were just in that building for about a year and I this happened. Wow. So I flew back to Seattle. The conference was in Nashville. And I got to the airport and instead of my house is halfway, the airport south of my home and this building is north of my home. But I was looking at my watch. I can get to that building before five o'clock. Okay. Yeah. This is the day I land. I keep driving because we had one computer science graduate in the building, one computer science graduate. And his, his name was Dave Hammond. And so I went straight to the building as fast as I could, legally, of course. I go up the steps and I stand over Dave's desk. I said, Dave, what is email? And he says to me, oh, it's a, uh, it's a text-based system where you can send messages over the internet. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. What is the internet? <laughs> he says, oh, it's an international system of data communication where you can exchange files and, and, and so on. Oh my God, this guy knows all this stuff. He sees that we don't have it, and he doesn't open his mouth. He said, Dave, set me up immediately. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know. That's incredible. <laughs> the guy works for me. He knew all about it, but he didn't say a thing. So next thing you know, he sets me up. I, 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 I learn it. He sets me up on WolfNet, which is gone now. I said, Dave, set up everybody. So there were wires hanging from ceilings, you know, everywhere there was wires going. And we hired an IT, uh, IT guy, John Whiting, who for some reason set himself up in the inspection room. I don't know why. And I asked him why. I said, John, why, what are you doing in the inspection room? He said, I like people. I don't know, it didn't make any sense to me, but okay. Um, he was in the inspection room and he had was where his IT hub was. Uh, Dave didn't want to do that. Dave let, you know, hired somebody else. And, um, and so um, we, we put everyone on the internet. And, um, and then the next thing we did, um, I used to give a buck an email. If anyone sent an email, I'd give them a buck. I had a pocket full of $1 bills. Because <laughs> I, I determined that if we could, if we could, seed the system and start the process everybody could work could be in touch wherever they were if we mm. would get away from leaving memos on people's desks and sending them an email then you could be in nashville or you could be in england or whatever and you could still get your information and so i started to, i give out a buck i had a whole pocket full of dollar bills um, and I gave him out. Anyone who sent an email, I gave him a buck. I gave him a buck. I gave him a buck. That's and smart. then it took off. And and um, and I, they um, he's Whiting hired at Steve Simister. He was his sidekick at Microsoft. Both Microsoft guys. And um, and then Mike Whiting went off and did. Um, he left and he did. He's still doing sports 
uh, online sports betting stuff. And Steve Simster is still there today. And wow. so that's how that started. But anyway, the, the building um, worked that well. And um, the only problem is we didn't have a high base space. So uh, I tried to buy the property next door and that, um, that property uh, wasn't for sale. Um, but I think I've missed something very important here. And that is to go back, roll the clock back. We're too far ahead of the story right now. Mm. I, want to tell yeah. the story. I want to tell the story about the red door. The red door. I've, I've never heard of this in much detail to your life. So as, as much as you want to turn back the clock, I'm all for it. Cause uh, that was a fascinating story. I mean, you were, you discovered the internet. <laughs> it's like, better than Christmas morning, rushed to the office. And then you basically were describing remote work at that point where you can communicate wherever you are in the world. Um, I thought that it's, I I knew from the moment I heard the two engineers eavesdropping from both from Boeing that came to my party. I had a party. We used to, you know, we, we used to rent a big, like a big hotel room and we'd fill the bathtub up with, beer, you know, and at the big conference we used to have, and we'd fill it up with beer and people would come and grab a beer out of the, out of the bathtub. And it was fun. Mm. Yeah, and you heard you it know, there. That, that kind of thing. We had, a, we ran a double room and then people could go back and forth. And, um, and there were two guys sitting at chairs and talking to each other. One said to the other, not having nothing to do with me. He said, I, I received an email from outside of Boeing. I said, Oh my God. I got to find out about this. So that's kind of how the world is. You know, you've got to, uh, you, you hear these things and you have to um, respond to them. Um, I just want to see if I can mm-hmm. find um, this, the red door. Yeah, so here's the red door. Wow, I'm fascinated. It's such a mysterious name to it. And this is freaky. Yeah, so there's the red door. That door is at MIT in building 36. You can see it's on building 36 on the fourth floor. You look, you see the numbers mm-hmm. next to it? That's building 36, uh, fourth floor. Mm-hmm. Belcher was on 36, third floor, my professor. And so I was, my life was to try to, um, you know, keep things moving on the third floor whatever had to be done, I would do it. And, and I would, um, you know, I'd go from one thing to the other, whatever had to be done to pr- pr- push the technology, I was doing it. But on the fourth floor, um, there was another professor, his name was, um, uh, I think his name, his name will come to my mind in a second. Um, hmm, I'll think of his name in a second, but he was mm. uh, very friendly to me. And, um, I don't know why I was uh, I was probably a junior or senior uh, when I got to know him and um, but he used to like to talk to me um, he's, he's a very successful professor in physics and um, his name was George it was George yeah George I think his name is second so um, anyway I was some he was a uh, Eastern European, um, uh, one of these people who left Eastern Europe, they would, um, you know, they go to a conference, they wouldn't go back home. So they would, um, they would. Um, mm, I see, like use that as an excuse. Okay. Yeah, they leave their country and they would, uh, and they would ask for asylum. They're asylum seekers because they didn't want to be put in the communist system. Um, and, um, so anyway, he was kind of interested in, in what I did. I, I, I had spent a lot of time, you know, I went to Israel for a summer and he was interested in that. He didn't know much about that. And, um, and so we would talk about politics and stuff, which seems kind of silly because he was a, um, you know, a senior, he was a full professor and I was a, like a, I was a senior at most of an undergraduate, but so it was. And um, we used to meet out in the lobby of Building 36. He would spend a lot of time out in the lobby. <laughs> I don't know why. 
I could always find him in the lobby. Um, and so I went up, I had something I wanted to tell him and I went up to the fourth floor in the lobby and he wasn't there. So I went down, um, I had to go up the stairs, you know, to the fourth floor. So I went down the hallway to where I thought his door was. I thought this was his door. And um, I opened the door to see if he was in the, inside. I'd never done that before. I always had found him in the lobby. And um, I went in and I said, um, and it was a dark room, hard to see. But my eyes quickly adjusted and I could see it was a dark room inside that door. And um, I could see that there was a graduate student, not a full professor like in his 40s or 50s. It was like a 20, 20 something graduate student sitting at a, at a, uh, in a workspace. Mm. And I said to him, I said, um, I said, is George here? And he said, no, George isn't in today. Okay. But on then on my right view, I saw a bank of electrolytic capacitors all ganged up with a bus bar across the top. And I saw that in my right eye and my left eye, I saw this graduate student. And I said to the graduate student, I said, does look gesturing toward the capacitors. I said, does that work? The graduate student was sitting on what I thought was a fusion generator, tokamak. It turns out I did a little research on it later on. It was an x-ray generator. Now you ask, you might ask, what's a, a student doing in an x-ray generator? I can tell you that it was a different world back then. We would do anything for science, anything. Mm. It was a different world. Um, but anyway, yeah, he was right on top of this thing. And it looked like I knew something that would need high energy to operate. And I, so I thought to myself, I said, does that work? He said, it worked fine. So, um, okay, I turned around and I left. I closed the door. Mm -hmm. 10 years later, that is the origin of Electro Impact. Is George wow. here? George is in here. Does that work? It works fine. That's that's how the company got started right there. So what was it like a like a seed that was planted in your subconscious of like, oh, this is an invention that can be made or like wh what was going through your head thereafter? Well, of course I forgot about it. It's nothing that, uh, <laughs> uh, that is something to, to, to memorialize. You know, I think George was back the next day and I talked to him and told him what I wanted to talk <laughs> about politics or whatever. Um, but it was in my mind somehow. And when I got to the university of Washington in 1983, they put us into these, um, what they call the ME Annex. And they, they, they gave us desks. You know, we had like 10 desks in a room. You know, they had a class. It was a classroom once in a while. And they just put a whole bunch of old desks in there. And it really is, I think it's a great environment. You know, I, I like that kind of environment. You know, because you can meet all the people and, you know, you interact with the people. So I thought it was great. And I was um, in that room. And um, one day, um, a professor came in. Uh, he was a research assistant professor, same, exactly the same job I had um, when I was at the University of Washington, research assistant professor. He was a research, you know, it's a, you know, when they have money, they can pay you, basically. Uh, I did it for two years, 86 to 88. And this was around, um, what? No, I'm in the middle of an interview. Can I? When can I take you? How long are we gonna go till? Uh, just for like twenty more minutes. In twenty Ten, minutes. No, yeah, fifteen twenty minutes. David, I'm taking twenty minutes. Okay, so um, he'll take. He'll just. He, he can take. This is a motorcycle. He can take. 
Um, so I was in that um, Emmy Annex. This would be, I went in the red door in, uh, yeah, I can hear you getting on the motorcycle, so don't worry about it. I, I went in the red door in, um, it would be, um, that's 1975. And in 1984, after I got to the University of Washington, it was the summer of the first year I was there, this research assistant professor came in that room and his, and his name was Maurer. And I said to him, I said, uh, I said, Professor Maurer, what are you doing for the summer? He said, I'm working on a riveting problem at Boeing. Because I knew, you know, the research assistant professors, they have to work to get paid for the summer. They don't get, they don't have any, get any income in the summer unless they're working. So they have to find some research to do if they want to get paid for the summer. And some of them, of course, take off and they travel. But George had a young family. I knew he was going to keep working. So I asked him, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to work. I got some money to work on re, uh, riveting for, at Boeing. I said, oh, that's, that sounds interesting. I didn't know what a rivet was. And I said, um, can you make, like, make a little sketch to me? You know, there was a chalkboard behind my desk. There was an old-fashioned chalk. There was no whiteboards. It was an old-fashioned classroom mm -hmm. with wooden floors. So he took a piece of chalk and he sketched out this riveting system that uses pulse power. And I thought to myself, all of a sudden, like my head exploded. The kid in the dark room said it worked fine. Nine years later, it, boom, it worked fine. So it'll work fine. So all of a sudden I knew that I could do something that nobody else could do because I knew it would work fine because the kid in the dark room told me it would work fine. And so I put all my energy into that and I started working on making riveters with electrolytic capacitors. Everybody else had made you know, them mechanical or made them with high voltage capacitors. But I knew that if I used simple electrolytic radio capacitors and I ganged them up with a bus bar, we'd still do it the same way today, just exactly what I saw in the dark room. I knew that it would work fine and it does work fine because we've made a thousand of them. That, that, that's that, The electro impact. Um, I'm not sure what you're seeing here, but uh, let me just yeah, the, I'm seeing the door, but that's an amazing origin story. I mean, it, yeah, the, I mean, the idea came before the idea thing here, happened. You see electro impact. That's what it is. Yeah. It oh, is. wow. Electro impact is that what I learned in that dark room, that it would work fine. I could run an impact riveter from the electrolytic capacitors, not scary high voltage, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 volt capacitors. I could run 300 volt capacitors. I can form a rivet because I knew it because he said it would work fine. So I knew it would work fine. And I was only in the room for 30 seconds. And I said, is, is, um, is he here? No, he's not here. Does that work? Now, here's the mystery. mystery. Why did I ask the question, does that work? That's what I don't get. I can't understand that because I don't think I had enough knowledge of what I thought it was and what it really was to know what kind of capacitor system would work or not work. I just don't think I had the knowledge at that point. In, in my so it's kind of like the, the curiosity led you eventually to creating electro impact. No, I knew it would work fine. Ah, okay. I, I mean, I stopped everything I was doing. I was working on some work for Flow Industries. Um, I was looking at some other research, and I said to uh, you know my professors that were my you know that I was reporting to, I said I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to work on this. I said they said what are you working on? I'm going to work on riveting. Oh, okay. W why do you think it's going to work? It'll work. <laughs> <laughs> How did I know? Because I, I went inside of a door at MIT nine years ago, and the kid said it will work fine. So, of course, it's going to work fine. And, um, and I, 
I started working on um, this uh, riveting process and um, I didn't think it was really Boeing's idea I, or the University of Washington's idea. I thought it was my idea. So, you know, um, so I went up to Boeing on my own. I went up there and I went and I met with Boeing. I, I found some engineers to meet with and I told them what I had in mind. I wanted to make a uh, electric pulse riveter, which with low voltage capacitors. And they said, we love that idea. Mm. Good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And they said, okay, well, you know, how do you want me to work for you? How, how do you want it to work? Can I like consult for you or can you, you buy it off me or whatever? They said, okay, look, what did I know? What did they know? They said, look, we'll go talk to the big boss and we'll get back to you. So um, here, just to give you a little more flavor of this. Here, actually. Here, let me share this with you so you can see. Okay, you see, you see the cover of my PhD? Wow, yeah. Okay, it's, this is from the, re this is from the door. And for the and audio, then, if for people listening on audio, it said low voltage electromagnetic riveter and then his yeah. name and then 1986, 1986, right? And then uh, if you go here, here's the, here's the. Uh, uh, so you wrote the entire, your entire life focus thereafter was like this thing. Has not stopped. It has not changed. It has not stopped. <laughs> it, this is from the, from what I, that, Asking the question, does that work, has created my career and thousands of other people too. Wow. Not all one time, but if I look at how many people have worked for this en enterprise, we're well over 2,000 right now. And some have been there for 35 years. It was because I asked the question. I said, does that work? Why did I ask that question? I consider that to be... Only God could have caused me to ask that question because I, even though I'm, I was very, I'm very interested in, in what everything Melcher taught in electromagnetics. Um, I just don't think I had enough background in, 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 at that exact, at that point of time mm -hmm. that I could ask the question, does that work? But still I asked the question, I said, does it work? He said, it works fine. So then when I was in the dark room and I went in the classroom in the, at, at the University of Washington and, and the, he showed me the uh, high voltage riveter. I said, it'll work fine. Of course, I didn't tell him because I didn't want him involved. And he actually was only there temporarily. He went back to the University of, uh, of uh, Las Vegas. Uh, mm. He had a good career there, but I, I wanted this to be my thing. So I said, no, it's mine. And I went to Boeing and then Boeing... Um, uh, looked at what I proposed and they liked the idea, but they came back to me. They called me on the phone. We, you know, um, we didn't have cell phones then. they called the, the phone in the office, gave them that number. They called the number and they said, we like what you're saying, but we want you to do it through the university of Washington as graduate research. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I won't fight you. So that's how I started working on this for my PhD, because Boeing said, you will do. And they're the bosses. And they said, you know, you will do this. And so it was deemed that that was what I was going to do. And they provided funding. Actually, it actually was unbelievably well funded. Wow. Uh, we had so much money coming from Boeing that, um, and why, because I think what they did was they said, well, we're going to put three or four people. I didn't want anyone working with me. I didn't let anybody work with me. I just did it all myself. And so the money came in and they, they had too much money. So I spent what I had to, but I remember um, a couple of years later, I think it was between my junior and senior year, they asked me to sign a, um, uh, a patent uh, form that would give the idea to combination Boeing and University of Washington. They hadn't asked me for the first two years. This is my third year working on it. And I said, no, I'm not going to sign it. I'm planning to start a company doing this. I'm not going to sign that form. 
And they said, well, you're perfectly within your rights, but we can't pay you. Mm. Of course they had to pay me. They had so much money coming and they had to pay me. They wouldn't, they would, it would have been embarrassing. <laughs> so they, they kept paying. In fact, they paid me double. They were paying me double. So were, Normally so a grad student is only paid half time. They had so much money, they paid me full time because they didn't know what to do with the money that was coming in. Because they told Boeing, I'm going to put two professors and, and I was just doing everything myself. So they, so they paid me, even though they told me in the meeting, you know, they called me into a meeting and they said, we can't pay. If you don't sign this, we can't pay you. I said, fine, don't pay me. I'm not going to sign. They said, okay, well, we can't pay you. They still paid me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, they had that, so much money in the budget. <laughs> and that's and that's where the, the theme of uh, having ownership comes up again, where it's like you don't want to give something away that you cherish. It's, I mean, you're working so hard on this. There's an article in the Seattle Times, which is just so stupid, that says that I stole the idea from Boeing. I did not steal the idea from Boeing. Um, I can show it to you. No, yeah, that. I can, uh, I can, I'll link it. I'll link it in the description. You don't have to show because yeah. I'll, I'll make yeah. sure I get it. That'd be perfect. It's called, Zeev says no to Boeing. I never said no to Boeing. They never, and they never asked me. <laughs> um, there, was, there was no hard feelings about that. But there's an article in the Seattle Times. It says Zeev says no to Boeing. Hmm. And they never asked. I mean. And one yeah. thing, one thing I would love to, yeah, to get Seattle like a, times has always been trying to figure out some every way under the sun to make, make my, me miserable. No, nah, well, that's, we're telling good. So stories. that's how it started the, the, the door and then applying yeah. it to this. And now of course I've got a product and I, I, with the product, I went out and I started, as soon as I got my PhD, I started, um, the, uh, the business. And then some people ask, how did you sell? Okay, so you have a one-man business. You know, how do you sell? Um, very easy, actually. What I did was, um, first of all, I was also, at the same time, I was a professor in electrical engineering. So I had a few things going on. But the company began to sell. And how it worked was, first of all, we had some friends at Boeing that were giving us little work, um, little projects. But... It much bigger was we would go to the SAE conference. Every year we would go to the SAE conference. What's the SAE stand for? Oh, somehow I lost it. Yeah, what, does S what does SAE stand for? Society of Automotive Engineers. But they also, it's, okay. it's Society of Automotive and Aerospace Engineers. Okay. So we would go to the SAE conference and we would, um, we would have a table and we'd pass out... Um, uh, we pass out uh, literature and stuff. And, you know, it, it was very small money, but that's all we needed. People would buy stuff. In fact, uh, I can show you the first, um, the first Riveter we sold. Uh, yeah. And, I, and after very, this, I would love to, because we're all about telling good stories here. Nothing, like you said, with Seattle Times stuff, all good stories and insp inspiring stories. I, want, I wanted to, after you show this picture, show the impact you created with Electro Impact and, and get a story on that. But I'd love to see the first ever product you sold here. I think I probably flashed up on the screen before. A busy man, if, uh, if those listening, they can hear the phone ringing. Just, just junk. <laughs> um, yeah, so here is um, the first Riveter we sold to, uh, where is it here? Yeah, there it is. So there you go. So, you know, not very fancy. Uh, there's the first Riveter in those boxes. That's going to Northrop. <laughs> Northrop bought that. Um, that's the first one we sold. It gets wow. about to be picked up and it's going to Northrop down in uh, their secret factory in Pico Rivera. Um, there it goes, it's heading out. There's the first one. Um, so, you know, that uh, that's, shows you there how we did it. And there's an, I can show you another picture here of the very first. And from the first SAE conference I went to, somebody wanted to see 
what this thing looked like. And so I bought this fan and you can see the first riveter inside of it. This is the first one I made. Mm. And uh, you see inside the van there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I drove that van all the way down to Los Angeles to show somebody at uh, McDonnell Douglas what the thing looked like. They weren't impressed. <laughs> it's very primitive, but it just, I, I got the name at, at the SAE conference. The guy says, I want to see it. Okay, you can see it. So I, and it wasn't done yet because we had a lot of parts from Boeing and we had to get rid of all the Boeing parts. We had to re return all the stuff to Boeing that we owned, what Boeing was owned, owed, that they owned, that we were using for, the, for my research. And we re returned all that. We had to make everything new new bench we had a bench from boeing we had to make new controls and um and i drove it all the way down to los angeles and i got down there and the guy said where's the drill and i said we don't have a drill it just forms the ribbon he said well where's the uh sealant inserter he said i don't know <laughs> so I, he's like oh, yeah good point i guess we have a lot of work to do yeah well they say they say reed hoffman you know creator of linkedin he was like if your first product's not terrible you're doing something wrong so you're doing something right by having to improve it yeah so that's that's what it looked like um and it was the first you know the first year driving it down to um california i showed it there um one of the fun things about it was when i got there one of the engineers that i worked with at boeing now had moved hit to employment to down to los angeles down to douglas Cor aircraft and then I, I saw him I was like what are you doing here I, I decided to, I wanted to work here so I saw him down there it was fun to see a friendly face in a crowd and um and he works for me today he still works for me today this would be 37 years ago wow that's incredible and I so the company has been along for how long since 86 so it would be incredible so right when you finished the the or right when you Got the approval on the PhD or the thesis. Next day, I filed. It. I had the papers filled out, wow. and the next day I dropped them in the mail. That's incredible. So one thing I, I would got, love to I ask: got my, I got my PhD diploma, walked down the aisle, and then the next day, I uh, next day, I had the papers and I dropped them in the mailbox. <laughs> the papers for like filing and incorporating a company. Yes. Wow. I dropped it. That's in the incredible. The day after. And, and one thing, one thing I would love to ask, you can uh, unshare the screen so it can just be face to face. Cause this one, this one's in a good story, but I would love to show the impact you created with this company through a story you have from individuals you met or someone met in a taxi, uh, the individuals oh. from Southeast Asia. I would love for you to tell that story. Cause it's, tr it's so amazing. It's, it's so amazing to me. It's crazy. It's, it's all surreal. Um, yeah. A month ago, my son, Daniel, he's, tw he's just turned 13 yesterday, but this was a few couple months ago. He was, um, you know, he's only, he was only 12 and he, he, he likes to take Ubers to get places. He can't drive and he takes Ubers. He's not supposed to, but he does. And he gets away with it about 90% 90, 90 of the time. Sometimes they call me and sometimes they just take him or he'll take a lift. So he was taking an Uber from one place to another and somehow the Uber driver noticed that his last name was Z, um, which is my last name. And he said, are you related to Peter Z? And he said, yeah, that's my father. And he said, I've, he said, I have come all the way from Southeast Asia to the United States because I read the story of Peter Zeev and I, it inspired me and I want to do something like that. And I was like, and I was trying to think how, where do you read my story? I mean, the only place I can think of would be the Forbes article. Mm. The Forbes article tells a little bit about that. Um, but um, that's, that probably be, uh, that would probably be what it is. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I did this, I did, I started this company with no investment. I never took a dime from anybody. And um, it's a great company. You know, it's a fun place to work. We're, we're in trouble now with the COVID, you know, the, the reduction of business, but we'll get out of it. You know, we're just gonna have to cut back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we ride with the aerospace industry. We're into 
rockets and um, satellites and all kinds of stuff that we work on. Ground yeah, that's, that's incredible. I mean, to show that someone's came all the way here just because of the impact you created. It's, it's incredible. I read, I read the Forbes article, but you know, it's, it's lifted a lot of boats. Um, there's a lot of people that uh, have worked there. Some have come in and really enjoyed it and then left. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if they wanted to go start another company, I'm happy for them. Yeah. I try to help them every way I can. Um, like Peter Janicki, I showed you him. He started a company that's bigger than Electric Impact right now, but far bigger. Wow. Um, and we're still on the best of terms. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's been a great, it's been a great ride and, um, I've never taken any investment from anybody and I, uh, you know, I think that's the way to go. It's just, you know. Yeah. Well, that, that's true. That's true. Business craftsmen and, and practitionership. It's like you built this with your own two hands figuratively, but also literally. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it and it's to see longer. where it's been. It takes longer. But it's the way to go. It's more rewarding. Mm. You know, I mean, for many years, I ran the company out of my back pocket. You know, I had a wallet in my left back pocket. That's how I, I ran the company out of my wallet. I just wrote checks. And um, it was for years like that. Wow. It, you know, I just ran it out of my back pocket. Yeah, yeah. And, and one thing I would love to ask, like looking back in hindsight, knowing you better, is... Um, what is what is something like one of the bigger lessons? I know this is a broad question, but like bigger lessons you can tell at others. Would it be the fact that you should just start something on your own and not get any outside investment? Just like build something, you know, delay gratification. It's okay to take time to do such a thing. Or, or would you impart some other type of wisdom um, to anyone well, else listening? I'm very much negative on venture capital. Because when you take venture capital, they make you sign that um, you, that you can be diluted and diluted. They they can control the dilution, not you. So I don't see any point in that. Because at the end of the day, you're working for them. So I don't see any point in that. So if yeah. you start a company, I would not get involved in that. You should always keep 51%. If you want to sell 49%, that's fine. But you don't want to lose control of your company. And I also, I, I think... Personally, you know, I mean, don't ask me. I mean, Mr. Gates, I say go back and run the run the show. You know, what are you talking? What's what's he starts this at Microsoft and he goes and he does something else? Bullshit. You know, I say Gates, go back and run that company. Yeah, and well, you know, there's there's people like you know, you'll run it better than anybody else will. I guarantee yeah. that. Yeah, you have people like Jeff Bezos too. He, he left Amazon. He's focusing on Blue Origin. No way. You go back there, Bezos, and you run that. <laughs> You started it, you run it. You run it till you drop dead in the ground. That's what I say. Mm. And you'll run it better than anybody else just because you are who you are. And that's what America is made of. I don't remember Henry Ford ever leaving Ford. I don't remember that. I never remember, I remember reading his autobiography. He never left Ford. It was his obligation to keep that, that company running. And he did. He kept it running through good times and bad times. But um, I, I think my thing would be, you know, is that uh, to keep the control, I think that that's important. Yeah. If you're the uh, entrepreneur, you should, uh, you should keep control. The other thing I would say is either, there's two possibilities. Obviously there's always a thousand possibilities. But I'm saying there's two possibilities. One is that God is very kind to me. That he gives me, I've just told you only some of the many incredible breaks that I've had. Hmm. Things that, you know, couldn't happen to anybody else. Or other people aren't listening. Hmm. Not listening. Those things are there and they're not listening. Like those whispers. Yeah. Like I changed the whole business by listening to one Boeing engineer talking to another Boeing engineer. Is that only happening to me or am I the one that's listening? Mm. So I don't know. I mean, who else goes into a dark room and comes up with an invention? Okay. I'm <laughs> saying maybe other people are going into those rooms, but they're not listening. So either that, either God is setting me up 
so I can do these the, 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 the things I've done that, that have been good for me and for my family. Or other people, it's happy. He's doing it for everybody, but they're not listening. And I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I, and I, there's a great analogy I was thinking of recently is that, you know, if you look at a rose once, it's like, oh my God, this rose is very beautiful. looks great. But over time, say you were to have a rose bush outside your house, the more you pass it, the more it might become like a law of diminishing returns. You know, you kind of like, all right, yeah, it's a rose bush, whatever. Eventually you don't even care about it, but it's not that the, the, the beauty of the rose phase, it's like our perception of the beauty of a rose phase. So it's like, with what you're saying, how I connect that is like, it's not that there aren't things there. It's just, you're not open to it. Um, and your, your mind's like a parachute. I mean, you're open to everything. That's why it's happened either, the way it's happened. Either God is giving me special clues and leaders and, and glimpses of, of, of the future that I can use or, He's giving them to everybody, but I'm better at listening mm. than many. Yeah. And there's others that are just as good as me. But I mean, I'm, I do pick up on little things. I eavesdrop on people and it's happened many, many times. I eavesdrop and I learn something and that change, it makes a big change in what, we, what I do and what my company does. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... Listen, listen to everything around you. That's great. That's great uh, advice. Great insight coming from someone who's lived the life you live. But I, I appreciate you running through your timeline and, and all the great stories. Um, yeah, everyone to emphasize to make sure to follow Peter and what he's doing and check out Electro Impact and uh, just apply listening to your own life. I think that would be the best way to put it. Um, but thank you. Well, thanks for having uh, spending some time with me. Yeah, of course.